In the Bible, the book of Ruth comes right after Judges, which records a very dark period in the history of God's people. The book of Judges recounts how the nation of Israel broke their covenant promise to obey God and keep His law. Instead, the people engage in idolatry. There's all kinds of moral corruption and even war amongst the tribes. The book concludes with the sad summation that everyone did what was right in his own eyes. But in the midst of those tragic times, we find this hopeful story of a few individuals who chose not to operate according to their own self-interest. It's a story of people who chose to stay true to God and to one another. And because of that, God works blessing in and through their lives. In chapter 1, we're introduced to a woman named Naomi and her daughter-in-law Ruth. The background is that Naomi and her husband and two sons have gone from the land of Judah to the neighboring country of Moab to escape a famine. In Moab, the two sons each get married. Then tragedy strikes. We don't have details, but while they are in Moab, first Naomi's husband dies, and then her two sons die, eventually leaving her with just her two daughters-in-law, Orpah and Ruth. Imagine the pain and sorrow of that family. Naomi and her husband and their two sons barely escape famine, do their best to survive in a new country as refugees. Things are looking up as the sons each get married and they're settling down, only to meet this series of calamities. And Naomi's bitterness is evident in what she later says to the people back in her hometown of Bethlehem. She said to them, Do not call me Naomi, call me Mara, for the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. I went away full and the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi when the Lord has testified against me and the Almighty has brought calamity upon me? Her name Naomi means pleasant or sweet, but she says, call me Mara or bitter. To be an old widow without children back then, this was considered the worst fate that an Israelite woman could experience. Without a husband or sons to provide for you or protect you, it's not like there is a government welfare or social security system in those days. So these three women are in a very dire situation. Then one day, there's some good news. Naomi hears that the famine in Israel is over and she decides to go back to her homeland. Then she arose with her daughters-in-law to return from the country of Moab, for she had heard in the fields of Moab that the Lord had visited his people and given them food. So she set out from the place where she was with her two daughters-in-law, and they went on the way to return to the land of Judah. But Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go, return each of you to her mother's house. May the Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grant that you may find rest, each of you in the house of her husband. Then she kissed them, and they lifted up their voices and wept. And they said to her, No, we will return with you to your people. It's a tender scene, and you can tell that tragedy and trauma has brought them close and forged a bond. Each of them lost their husbands, and all they have left is one another. So they weep together, and they don't want to part. But out of love, Naomi encourages her daughters-in-law to stay in Moab. It's something very practical for them to do. It's time now to split up, go their own ways. After all, they're not blood-related. Ruth and Orpah are still young. They can go back to their own mother's house and start over. They can go back to Moab, get married again, have a new life. It's sensible advice. It's time for them to cut their losses. In the end, Orpah says goodbye and decides to stay in Moab. But in verse 14 it says, But Ruth clung to her. And Naomi says to Ruth, See, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. And this is Ruth's incredible response. But Ruth said, do not urge me to leave you or to return from following you. For where you go, I will go, and where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die, and there will I be buried. May the Lord do so to me, and more also, if anything but death parts me from you. Wow, this is an incredible statement of Ruth's loyalty and commitment to her mother-in-law, Naomi. For where you go, I will go, and where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, and your God, my God. It's very concrete. She's not just wishing her well, good luck Naomi, I'm with you in spirit. It's a very self-involving promise. I'm there. I'm going to be right where you are. We're going to get through this together. Nothing but death is going to part me from you. She makes a vow that is basically as serious as a marriage commitment, till death do us part. And when Naomi saw that she was determined to go with her, she said no more. What does it take for Ruth to make this kind of commitment? What would it mean for her to follow Naomi back to the land of Judah? It means she's leaving behind her homeland. She'll probably never see her family again. She's going to enter a foreign land as a widow, so she might never get married. She might face persecution and discrimination. And as Ruth and Naomi are both widows, they don't have the protection and provision that would normally come from having a male in the household. To go with Naomi means Ruth is placing her relationship with Naomi above her own well-being and best interests. She's committing not to abandon Naomi in her time of need, 
when her husband and sons have died and she has no one left. Ruth is saying, I will stay with you no matter what. And it also goes beyond physically accompanying her. It's more fundamental than that as Ruth's very identity, her allegiance, it's going to be your people shall be my people, your God, my God. This is the language of total commitment, of common destiny. Whatever happens to you happens to me and we're in this together. And close relationships are built on promises like this. A covenant, a commitment, a vow to stick with someone through all the ups and downs no matter what. And this is the very essence of relationships as God intended for us. But this kind of commitment, this kind of vow to stick together, it's really rare in our day. I mean, not just rare, it's, it's strange, it's odd. We live in such an individualistic society and the only enduring commitment seems to be the commitment to self. You know, back in the day, I think professional athletes were pretty tied to the team that they played for. But these days, it's rare to see a star player staying with one team for their career. Actually, it's pretty normal to switch around from team to team in that quest for a championship ring. And that's just sports, but in more significant relationships, friendships, even marriages, which are supposed to be based on a lifelong vow of loyalty and commitment, our society is infected with this idea that ultimately, I just need to be true to myself, my own feelings, my own needs. And if some relationship isn't doing it for me, then yeah, I'm out of there. And that's not being selfish, that's just normal. You do you. I mean, that is the attitude that we affirm. And so it's a non-committal, very fair weather sort of society that we live in. When it comes down to it, I just need to do what's best for me because life is ultimately about me. And above all, I'm committed to one person, myself. So what kind of advice would Ruth get in our modern day world, I wonder? Her Moabite friend would come and say something like, Ruth, are you crazy? Why go with Naomi? I mean, that's a dead end. You've stuck with her long enough. Now it's time to do what's best for you. And when someone breaks free of those encumbering commitments and restrictive promises, that is seen as a good thing, a liberation. Like I'm finally free to be me. But is that true? Like a dad who wants to break free, who doesn't want to live confined to the role of husband and father and what that's supposed to mean. Because after all, he says, I got to be my own man. I got to do what I want to do. And maybe he doesn't feel like setting a good example for his kids. Maybe he's not going to bother restraining his temper or interactions with other women because it's not good to repress that and, and I got to be me. I got to do whatever feels right to me. And you can see how that sort of thinking and shirking of commitments could quickly go downhill. If all I have to direct me are my preferences and my well-being. So I think our overriding identification with the self, rather than with the group or the community, I mean, maybe this is the mentality that is eroding our relationships and organizations. From friendships and families to public institutions and government. I mean, what happens when more and more of our commitments are up for renegotiation and all our associations with others are just tentative and temporary? I think it leads to a pretty brittle and fragmented society. If ultimately I'm just committed to myself, then the bottom line is I'm going to act in my own self-interest. Other people, they're acting in their own self-interest. So we just don't have that much to do with one another. And maybe this is behind much of the mounting anxiety and loneliness in our society. We think no one cares. Everyone's just isolated, alone on the island of their own concerns. Every problem is just my own to deal with and there's no one else I can really depend on. Our relationships are thin and surface level. There's no deep connection. And even though we might have people to hang out with in good times, there's really no one to lean on during the bad times. We've all just been told, worry about yourself, take care of yourself. But this is not how we were meant to live. This is not the biblical vision of what it means to be human, to be these detached individuals just floating through life with no connection to others. Rather, I think instinctively we grasp that the beauty of a life of long-term commitment and faithfulness. Like an elderly couple who've been through thick and thin together, celebrating their 50th wedding anniversary. We're inspired and challenged by those who put themselves at risk and make sacrifices because of their commitment to a higher cause or to one another. Like a company of Marines running back towards danger to rescue their fallen comrade. I mean, it seems really impractical. It's not in their own best interest, but it's beautiful and right. You know, recently I had a chance to go to Ground Zero and the 9-11 Museum. And there were so many moving stories of heroism and sacrifice. One story was about a particular fire company called Ladder 3 
that responded after the attacks. At that time, there was a shift change, but both the firemen going off duty and those just starting their shift reported to the North Tower together, and the whole company rushed up the stairs to help people evacuate. They were last known to be on the 40th floor when the tower collapsed, and all 12 firefighters did not make it out. Where you go, I will go. Where you die, I will die. When people live with that kind of commitment to one another, that not even death will part us, when we see that kind of loyalty and faithfulness being displayed, I think it's so moving. Because deep down we know that this is how we were meant to live. Not a small, detached, selfish life, but a life that is tied to others, bound with covenant and promise. When Ruth says to Naomi, I will follow you to the end, where you die, I will die, it's such a different kind of value system from the world. Life is not about me first. My concerns are not just about my own, but it's about us. And in fact, I'm going to put your concerns above my own. I think we were meant to live with these kinds of relationships of faithfulness and loyalty, staying true to one another, regardless of circumstances, regardless of what it costs us. Now this, this is just beautiful and right because this kind of faithfulness is in God's very nature. God at his very core is relational. He's triune. He's community within himself. And he created us in his image to be in relationship with him and with others. After making man, he said, it is not good for man to be alone. And as we saw at the beginning of this series, God called Abraham to journey with him. But it was to make out of him a great nation, a people. And so from the beginning, Walking with God has meant walking with God's people. God tells Abraham, I will make of you a great nation. He says to Israel, you will be for me a kingdom of priests. The picture of the church in the New Testament is one body. Every part joined together, every part suffering together, every part rejoicing together. This is what God intends for each of us. Not to be a single individual navigating life, but part of a tribe of his people, a member of the body of Christ. And this is how God works blessing in our lives. So at this point, I'd like to pause from Ruth and share this testimony from a group of friends. This is from a group of brothers at our church here in New Jersey. They're college friends. They graduated a while back. But here's their story about how God brought them together and worked in their relationships with one another. Hi, my name is Jarrell. I'm part of class of 2014. And today we're going to share some different stories about me and my friends. So we've known each other for over 10 years now, and we've been through quite a lot together. So we just wanted to share some stories about who we are and how our friendships developed over the years. Um, yeah, so back in the day, I really did not like to get my shoes dirty. I never even walked on the grass because I didn't want to get the dirt on my shoes. So yeah, our, our group, all of a sudden, we just you know took this unexpected trip to the beach. And I was like, oh no, I really don't want to get sand in my shoes. So as everybody was you know running onto the beach, I turned to Tony and I was like, Tony, please carry me and to my surprise he carried me and i just hopped on his back and he gave me a piggyback ride and I was, at the time i didn't know it was that embarrassing yeah i just remember when you asked me and i was like all right sure i remember this one time where biku and i were on uh, a long drive it was like an hour and a half and at the beginning oh. of the drive he was like <laughs> i have a sore throat I'm not going to talk. <laughs> and for the entire drive, he didn't oh, say anything. Man. I kept talking to him and he would just go, hmm, hmm. Not this one. <laughs> for the entire hour and a half. I just wanted to heal up faster, Stan. <laughs> yeah, my bad. <laughs> so we had some humble beginnings, but slowly we started to get close. Yeah, I remember my sophomore year, I would take walks with Jarrell. And yeah, we would talk about you know what we got out of the messages, how the Word of God spoke to us, and I think yeah, that was the first time where I talked you know about something that's more substantive rather than like talking about new gadgets or basketball or something like that. <laughs> Dude, you still talk about gadgets and basketball. <laughs> but yeah, anyway, I do. <laughs> but yeah, I, I did really appreciate how Biku was the one to help us to open up more. I remember one night he just reached out to me and he was like, "Hey man, let's just let's go for a walk." And then we actually, we actually did. <laughs> we talked and caught up for a good while and I felt like we actually grew close through that time. And I, I felt like he was that kind of peer to just help um, each of us just open up. I remember we had one housemate and he was like really persistent, like, hey man, you, you need to open up. <laughs> I, re I really appreciated how Biku was that kind of peer, just helping us to all um, open up and just get a little deeper with each other. 
There was this one time when we went on a pure camping trip to Joshua Tree. We went on a hike and when we got to the top, we scrambled around, grabbed some big rocks and we passed around some permanent markers. And each of us, we wrote commitments to serve God more together through whatever scary situation that would come. And we hid those rocks under a ledge, which one day hopefully we can take another pure trip out there and find those stones and remember. Quite a few of us wrote church planning one day and at that time it was foreign and scary for us. Uh, but little did we know that in the months to come, church planning for the East Coast would be that exact opportunity for us to serve God more. Somehow God brought us together and we even became Christian together. Uh, but sticking together and not giving up on each other definitely had its challenges. I wanted to get closer with my peers, but I was a commuter. So I wanted to live with them to get to know them better. But since I was a commuter who lived at home, it didn't make sense for me to move to campus. I had to give up my parents' approval, who not only disapproved of my faith, but also the decision to move to campus since it seemed so impractical. And being a, an extreme introvert, I gave up my personal comfort to spend time with my peers, and I felt like dying to live in such chaotic household times. But it was good to grow outside of my insular self and to grow closer with my peers. I remember all of us moving in together our senior year, and it was about 10 of us. And if you included all the other students we hosted, it was about 14 or more. And we definitely had our conflicts. We'd meet up every Sunday night as a house to talk about all our issues with each other, from things serious to even things like, who's the one leaving all these cups out there? And week after week, I'd have to confess, or, I'm sorry guys, those are my cups. Um, but I was thankful that my friends were gracious. Uh, these meetings, they sometimes lasted up to four hours because we were going in circles and at times we just didn't know how to work things out. And it was a real process of us learning how to bring things up and talk things out, to apologize and to forgive one another. Uh, but it was through these kinds of times that helped us to learn how to work together and helped us to grow close. Going through conflicts was a big challenge, but I'm so thankful that we learned to work them out. One moment that I remember kind of fondly, even though it was in the midst of a fight, was when I was arguing with Kevin. I don't even remember what we were fighting about, but Kevin and I were yelling at each other over some petty thing all night. And at one point I was like, why can't you just let it go? And he yelled back at me, because I'm committed to you. I'm committed to loving you. I was so caught off guard by that. It was kind of a bittersweet moment, but I remember it fondly because in the midst of our low points, he reminded me that he was committed to me as a brother in Christ. And so I can trust that he'll be with me through all the ups and downs of life. Being able to stick it through was tough, but it was worth the investment because we were able to count on each other when it mattered the most. I remember when my mom was sick and getting treatment for cancer. That was a really tough time for me, but I was able to get through it with my friends beside me. They would pray for me, they would pray for her, they would ask me how she was doing. And just through those times, I was able to grow a lot closer with them and to get through that tough time together. I remember that it wasn't just like a random text from a stranger saying, I'm praying for you, but these were the guys I was doing life with. I remember a time when Jarrell was cutting my hair and he would ask me how I was doing, how my mom was doing with her cancer treatment. And through those times, I just felt really encouraged and we grew a lot closer with one another. Over the years, we remained faithful to one another and through it, we experienced God in a special way. Jarrell, Tony and I committed to serve together at CBP after we graduated. This was a scary time going to a new campus to start a new ministry group together. There were challenges because we didn't know what we were doing and oftentimes the campus was empty or we didn't get to meet many people. But as we stuck together to serve at CBP, we saw the ministry grow as students like Albert Shellen, Christian Liu, and Caitlin Johnson came out. We saw God save their lives through the gospel, and now I get the experience of seeing them zealously serving together at CBP. One way I experienced God was through my friends carrying me in tough times. Man, our first year in New Jersey, it was, it was rough. Um, I had a long commute. I was you know, commuting to Doylestown, Pennsylvania, and Kevin was going to New York, and Stanley, he was somewhere in North Jersey. And yeah, just knowing that my friends are in this, you know, the long commute, uh, jobs are difficult, and ministry that's discouraging. Yeah, I think just knowing the fact that they're out there just helped me to push through. Uh, I remember, you know, rooming with Jarrell. Uh, we would pray and share every night. And just remember, remembering that, I know that God was using my friends to help me persevere uh, out here. Some advice I'll give to people out there on how to develop deeper friendships is that it just takes a lot of time. You know, we weren't all that close or had much in common, but it was just taking those scary steps to open up and then realizing that we're struggling with similar things and even struggling through those things together. 
And it also involved doing scary things like going out to Pomona. Um, it was just all those things repeatedly over time that drew us closer together. So, you know, it might be hard that you might be expecting to develop those friendships right away, but just give it time. My advice would be to stick it out with the relationships you have. Growing up, I would leave relationships based on the fact that the person annoyed me, uh, bruised my ego, or we had relational conflict. I would be quick to leave relationships that made me uncomfortable. But I think through sticking it out with my friends, through the ups and downs, I learned how to relate with people, resolve conflicts, do uncomfortable things, and take risks to open up and be vulnerable. Through all of that, I've gotten to grow and have friendships that last, and friends with whom I can trust and attempt great things with. So don't give up. Nowadays, I'm very thankful for my peers in these friendships that I couldn't imagine life without them. In 10 years, we've gone through many milestones together. College, graduation, marriage, kids, and most importantly, we've experienced God over the years as we stuck together to serve. And we got to see how God works in such amazing ways, even through just an ordinary group of friends with no special talents, who are just trying to love God, love others, and love one another. I remember in 2014 when we graduated, Cal Poly Pomona Ministry was started with just seven people, including myself and two of my friends. We had no idea what we were doing since we didn't have any ministry experience. And because of that, we made many mistakes. Yet God somehow worked through us to be a blessing to the students there. Now the students whom we just tried to love and be the church to have graduated themselves and taken up the mantle to continue to share the gospel with their own school. And then in 2017, there were five of us from the Riverside team that were sent to Rutgers. And again, nothing special about us. Yet as we tried to love God, love the students here, and love one another, we saw God somehow work through our lives. And as I think about all this, the verse that comes to mind is John 13, 34 to 35. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, just as I have loved you. You also are to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. Thank you for sharing that. I'm so thankful for how God worked through their commitment to one another over all these years. I think we saw how that led not only to blessing for them, but also enabled them to become a source of blessing to others. And I think this is a picture of how God works. When he saves us, he saves us into community, into fellowship. And in that context, he forms us and forges us together into sources of blessing. So now getting back to the story of Ruth. Ruth and Naomi come back to the land of Judah, but the problem is they don't have food. They don't have jobs or husbands with jobs. The good news is that God had instituted a way to help those who were destitute like them. A righteous Israelite farmer was supposed to be a little bit sloppy when it came to harvesting. And instead of reaping their fields all the way to the edges, they were to leave some grain behind for the poor to come and gather it. And so Ruth goes out to find a field to glean in, and the field she happens to go to belongs to a man named Boaz, who is a relative of Naomi. And Boaz shows kindness to Ruth. He tells his worker to leave behind extra grain for her to gather. It turns out that he's heard about how Ruth chose to return with Naomi from Moab, and she didn't abandon her mother-in-law. But Boaz answered her, All that you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband has been fully told to me, and how you left your father and mother and your native land and came to a people that you did not know before. The Lord repay you for what you have done, and a full reward be given you by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. So this is why Boaz really wants to honor Ruth's loyalty and faithfulness. She continues to work in Boaz's field, and this is how she and Naomi are able to survive. And then when Naomi finds out that Boaz has shown kindness and favor to Ruth, this starts to change her view of her own circumstances and of God. Remember how she used to be bitter about her situation. Well, now she says, May he be blessed by the Lord, whose kindness has not forsaken the living or the dead. Now, this word translated kindness, in Hebrew, the word is hesed. And it encompasses a lot more than just being nice or showing favor. It's also translated often as steadfast love. And it describes God's qualities of loyalty, faithfulness, as well as showing grace and kindness to someone in need. And this is one of the main themes in the book of Ruth, God's character of hesed. And one of the lessons of Ruth's story is that God's hesed, his kindness and steadfast love, it gets manifested concretely as his people behave selflessly in ways that reflect his character. We see it here as Boaz shows this kind of favor to Ruth and Naomi. And it's also exemplified when Ruth stays with Naomi, comes back to Israel with her, and she disadvantages herself for the sake of her mother-in-law. 
This is at the very nature of hesed, to be self-giving, to be willing to become lesser for the sake of another. The rest of the book centers on what Boaz does for Ruth and Naomi in his capacity as kinsman redeemer. So what's that? Well, generally a redeemer is someone who delivers or rescues another person by paying a price. Like if there's someone who was in debt or had to sell their land in order to make ends meet, the kinsman and redeemer was a close relative who could redeem or buy back that land that was sold. It was basically a way to bail out a family member who had become destitute or taken on a debt that they couldn't pay. And it turns out that Boaz is a kinsman of Naomi's late husband. And that meant he was qualified to redeem Naomi's estate. That would mean purchasing her land back for her, but also because Ruth was a widow in that family, Boaz also had the right to marry Ruth. And in this way, Boaz, acting as kinsman redeemer, could provide for both her and Naomi, and they would no longer be destitute. And so, Boaz chooses to be their kinsman redeemer, and then he and Ruth get married. So in contrast to those in the time of the judges, when everyone did as he saw fit, we see Ruth disadvantaging herself to stay with Naomi, Boaz going out of his way to extend protection and favor, and ultimately providing for both of these widows. The book ends with Boaz and Ruth having a child named Obed, who would later become the grandfather of King David and thus part of the human lineage of Jesus. And so Boaz and Ruth both appear in the genealogy of Jesus in Matthew 1. In fact, Ruth is one of the four women who appear in that genealogy. And I think in this way, the Bible affirms Ruth and Boaz and their character of faithfulness and loyalty. It's almost like God is saying, this is what I'm about, because their actions mirror the very kindness and mercy of God. There's an interesting passage in the book of Isaiah in which God speaks to his people with these very tender words. Fear not, for you will not be ashamed. Be not confounded, for you will not be disgraced. For you will forget the shame of your youth and the reproach of your widowhood you will remember no more. For your maker is your husband, the Lord of hosts is his name, and the Holy One of Israel is your Redeemer. The God of the whole earth he is called. Throughout the Old Testament, in fact, God refers to himself as the Redeemer of his people. But it's also interesting that in this passage, Israel is represented as a widow and God as the husband who redeems her. And some commentators have noted the parallels with the story of Ruth. In this way, I think this story is a wonderful foreshadowing of Jesus and his redeeming work on the cross. Jesus is the true redeemer, not just for one family, but for all of mankind. And he not only disadvantaged himself and made himself lesser for our sake by taking the form of a human being, but he paid the highest price of his own life in order to rescue us. Titus 2, 13 to 14 calls him our great God and Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. This is a story of our redemption. This is what Jesus did. When we were spiritually destitute and impoverished because of our sins, Jesus showed us kindness and mercy that we did not deserve. In the greatest act of hesed on the cross, Jesus gave himself for us to redeem us. He paid the price of our sins that we could not pay, and he secured for us eternal blessing and salvation. Praise God for his kindness and steadfast love. And so now we are his. We are freed from our debts. We are redeemed onto eternity. And Jesus invites us as his disciples to extend this same steadfast love and kindness to others. So may we learn to love just as he loved us and live lives of commitment and faithfulness to him and to one another. Amen.